Thank you for joining me for this video about The Kite Runner. This video is aimed for students studying the novel for their A-level in English Literature, but it might also be useful if you're studying the novel for another course um, or are just reading the novel for pleasure and want to understand it fully. Um, this is the last video in this series because we're approaching the end of the novel. These are the last uh, few chapters of the novel. Um, so it's all about the ending now, um, and I'll put the uh, links to all the other relevant videos for The Kite Runner in the description box below. So chapter 21, um, we are at, uh, we're firstly driving around Kabul. So uh, before going to the Ghazi Stadium, which Zaman, the orphanage owner in the previous chapter, told Amir to go to to find Sorab, or at least find a man who knows about where Sorab is, um, Farid and Amir go back to Amir's childhood home and he notices how it has changed. He walks up to the pomegranate tree and he still sees that despite it uh, dying, uh, he still sees that the, the names Hassan and Amir, the sultans of Kabul, are still etched into the trunk. And that creates a sense of melancholy because despite everything, that mark, that symbol of their friendship has still remained uh, firm and strong. Um, he also notices that sense of alienation, which you feel when you sometimes move house, which is you see somebody else's car on the drive where you used to live, and it's just a bit odd sometimes. So he, he notices that um, despite his father's house still being there, it's different because of the time that has passed. Um, the night before the, the visit to the stadium, uh, Farid and Amir book themselves into, ho into a hotel and they entertain themselves by telling jokes. But the humour ends because, again, it shows how uh, the distinction between Pashtun and Hazaras are still there. The prejudice is still there. And that makes Amir conclude that maybe Afghanistan was a hopeless place uh, because it doesn't seem to progress. Um, and then the significant part of this chapter, I would argue, is the bit where um, Amir visits the Ghazi Stadium, the, the football match. And during the half time uh, break, the interval, um, the Taliban bring out a man and a woman who are accused of adultery and they are stoned to death in line with Sharia law. This acts from the Taliban's perspective as a form of public spectacle and it's a form of public education. In other words, don't do the wrong thing, because if you do the wrong thing uh, before God, then we will punish you. And after a time, uh, after the stone throwing has been going on for a few minutes, the crowd actually doesn't react anymore because Amir says, I guess people's throats had tired, which suggests that the um, Afghan population have become so used to seeing these acts of violence publicly that they've almost become desensitised to it. So again, it goes to show uh, the dystopian reality of this regime. Of course, what the cleric says in the microphone before the stoning takes place is an example of how this is a theocratic totalitarian regime, very similar to the Gilead in the Handmaid's Tale, with the cleric repeating the word God several times, suggesting that they feel legitimate in their actions because they feel that God agrees with it and is on their side. Um, so that theocratic thinking, the corruption of religion here um, to suit their own extremist agenda is evident. The way in which it says the second half is underway suggests, again, that this is a public execution and it's a regular occurrence as well. It's almost like a strange and perverse halftime show, if you think of the Super Bowl. Um, so and then we have um, the hypocrisy of the Taliban revealed because uh, it later obviously turns out to be Asaf. Um, his arms spread like Jesus on the cross, which ironically alludes to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, which is a symbol of sacrifice and salvation for mankind. But as well as that, he's also wearing sunglasses and the sunglasses is, is a symbol of westernised society, which the Taliban proposed to hate. And yet they're wearing westernised clothing or accessories. And it also shows, of course, in the hypocrisy of their religious teaching uh, according to them, God dislikes adultery, but does not dislike murder. So again, it's this warped thinking in terms of how they've used religion to legitimise their actions. You've also got um, the sunglasses making Asaf look like John Lennon, which again is another ironic reference 
because John Lennon wrote a song called Imagine, which was all about ending war and poverty. You can search the lyrics on Google if you wish or watch it on YouTube. So it's an ironic um, subversion, I suppose, of a heroic or sacrificial figure. Fact 22 um, is all about when Asaf and Amir uh, meet at the Talib compound, which results in the fight scene. We also are made aware that Sarab is here. He's alive and well. However, it's implied that he is being exploited for the Talib's entertainment through dancing, but also sexual abuse. So again, it shows how uh, with Hassan's rape, how uh, sexual abuse and sexual violence is often used as a force um, of, of power and also corruption. Um, coincidentally, um, as well, uh, you know, seeing as that talent member could have been anybody, uh, that Talib official is Asef. Um, and like we've always said with Asef, the way he behaves as a child between chapters five to ten makes him the perfect candidate for this nationalistic, extremist, uh, theocratic Taliban member. Um, his body language um, towards Sarab is actually quite uncomfortable and quite perverse, uh, touching him in, in quite intimate places, suggesting that Asef is using Sarab as a weapon to taunt Amir. Again, the hypocrisy of the Taliban is shown because the Taliban were supposed to have banned music, but what does Sarab dance to? with bells around his ankles, he dances to music. So again, it shows that hypocrisy. Um, and the bells around the ankles, very similar to shackles, I would argue, uh, in trapping Srab in this kind of dystopian existence. Asef and Amir have a conversation. They talk about ethnic cleansing. They talk about how Asef suffered from kidney stones, but how he liked being kicked because it meant that the kidney stones passed. And it basically just goes to show Asef's behaviour, because it's obviously been many years since we've seen Asef. We last saw him in Chapter 8, in fact, uh, at, at um, Amir's 13th birthday party a long time ago now. And the fight scene. So um, Asef and Amir fight. Asef claims that only one of them will leave the room alive. During that fighting, um, Amir actually starts laughing out loud because it's a way in which he's feeling the pain and he feels like he is being punished finally for the past. Echoes the same way that Asef laughed during his kidney stones kicking. Um, and interestingly as well, it appears that Amir is going to be killed because uh, Asef seems to be the better fighter. However, thanks to Sorab um, and the slingshot again, um, Sarab uh, hits Asef's eye with a small ball bearing from the table that was knocked over and uh, that enables um, Amir and Sarab to escape and flee. Um, think about, you know, shooting the eye out. The eye is often seen as the window to the soul and to have no eye or eyes in this case would suggest you are metaphorically soulless. So it links to Asef's characterisation. Interestingly as well, of course, um, just like the chapter five, when Hassan threatened to use the slingshot but never did against Asef in the in the street, Amir is saved again by somebody of inferior status, this time a Hazara child, and he's a man. So again, he's only alive because of Sorab and Sorab's bravery and courage in the face of an aggressor. So the fight scene is very important, and it's often a part of the novel that students refer to in an essay question. As we've already said earlier in the novel, the slingshot is a symbol of justice and rebellion, and it is also echoed by the way in which Hassan uses it in chapter five to protect Amir from Asef. Uh, Asef's language is, of course, going to be inflammatory uh, in referencing America. How is that whore these days? Um, and as we've already said, his body language is um, very uncomfortable, indicative of sexual abuse. And just like following the rape in chapter seven, uh, Hassan's blood stains the white snow red. In this case, you have got the blood on Asef's white garment from the stoning, again, showing that contrast between purity and goodliness and butchery and evil. So again, that kind of red on white image, uh, again, we have seen here. 
Following the escape of the compound, Amir is in hospital and the chapter begins actually very fragmented as Amir goes in and out of consciousness. He's, you know, knocked out, zonked out on morphine, as you might expect, because he suffered some terrible injuries. Um, and it materialises that in Rahim Khan's letter that he's gone away to die quietly. And in that letter, we learn many things, uh, some of them being that he knew about the rape and the framing with the money in chapter nine. Um, he regrets not telling Amir sooner that he had a half brother. Uh, he also goes to explain Baba's behaviour. So the reason why Baba was perhaps quite strict towards Amir when he was growing up was because he was a tortured soul. Um, which is at odds with his description as a towering passion specimen. In other words, he was a man who was actually quite weak beneath the surface, perhaps. Um, and it's made clear by Rahim that Baba took his frustration out on Amir because he couldn't openly acknowledge his love of Hassan or his fatherhood of Hassan. And Baba built orphanages and did good things, uh, such as fix Hassan's lip uh, as a birthday present to try and redeem himself. Um, we also learn that there are no cold wells, so Rahim Khan lied, and therefore Amir is stuck with Sorab. He doesn't really quite know what to do with him at first. And Amir has to leave the hospital prematurely because um, he's worried about the Taliban speaking and somebody coming to kill him in the hospital based on what happened with Asef. So um, they leave quite soon because of the sense of paranoia and th that idea of revenge. Somebody might come and seek revenge. Um, chapter 24, um, Arya just said goodbye to, um, and that leaves Amir and Sarab alone in the hotel room. Um, Farid did take, um, Amir to a safe with some money in that Rahim Khan had hid. So he's got some money for a hotel. And, uh, Amir wakes up and, um, Sarab is gone. And it actually materialises that Sarab went for a walk to the Shah Faisal Mosque. Um, which perhaps um, Sarab associates with a place of safety rather than with religious violence associated with the Taliban. The mosque, by the way, can hold a quarter of a million worshippers, so it's a huge mosque. Um, here, at, on the steps of the mosque, uh, Amir and Sarab have a touching and emotive conversation about how uh, Sarab feels dirty and how he feels he'll be punished for what he did to Asef. And he just expresses how he wants to go back to when Sanibar was around and when they were living in Bamiyan uh, or a village near Bamiyan with Hassan and his mother. So, um, of course, uh, time is quite um, negative because you can't go back. It's quite ruthless in that sense. Um, and you have to carry on going forward. Um, at this point, Amir asks Sarab if he wants to go to live in America. Um, and Sarab doesn't really know, I think. But at this point, uh, Amir is quite oblivious as a as a normal person to the complex bureaucracy and legal frameworks surrounding adopting Afghan children and bringing them back to America. So as a way to research this, um, Amir sees two people. The first is Raymond Andrews, who works at the US Embassy in, um, I think it's uh, Pakistan. And at first, Raymond seems passive, dismiss dismissive and disinterested, um, but it later materialises that his daughter has died and uh, he's probably grieving. So it's interesting, there's an irony there, that this is also a father who has lost a child um, and, has, uh, and is suffering. The second person is um, uh, Omar, who is a lawyer. And again, he also expresses doubt on the likelihood of Amir adopting Sorab or bringing him back to America uh, because of this idea of having to prove that you are an orphan when there's no proof of that. There's no death certificate for Sorab's parents, for example. So Amir is, I think, quite vexed in terms of having to jump through these bureaucratic hoops, which don't seem to be realistic considering the turmoil that Afghan is going through, that Afghanistan is going through. Um, Amir makes a fundamental error. His error was promising that um, Sarab would not have to go back into an orphanage, but at one point that looks like that will happen in order to bring Sarab back to America. And that will have dire consequences, going back on that promise, making a broken promise to Sarab, just when Amir begins to get Sarab's trust 
uh, has dire consequences for what happens at the beginning of chapter 25, the last chapter. Of course, it's very hard for Saab to trust adults because the majority of adults that he has had in his life have either disappeared, been killed or have abused him. So it's very hard for Saab to trust Amir. And just as that trust was beginning to blossom, um, that trust is yet again harmed because Amir has to go back on that promise. So that has, uh, you know, could have been worse, but it had dire consequences, as we'll see when we talk about chapter 25 in a second. Um, because Soraya and Amir can't have their own children, Sarab almost becomes a way in which they can also um, have children um, and it can mean that Amir can have some fatherly duty and to have some responsibility for somebody other than himself. Raymond Andrews, uh, the US embassy worker, um, has tomato plants, which he seems to be more interested in than Amir and Sarab, to be honest with you. And he's, he's in grief, he's grieving. So the way in which he nurtures those tomato plants, again, shows that due to the loss of his daughter, he's looking for something to look after. Um, so again, it, that could show a, a degree of, of grief there. The last chapter actually begins um, in a very uh, harrowing manner with the attempted suicide of Saurabh. So uh, Saurabh takes um, his father's razor in the bath and I think tries to uh, cut his wrists. And thankfully, uh, Amir manages to, uh, you know, get hospital and medical help just in time. After a long operation, Sarab does survive, but it does go to show how life generally has really taken its toll on Sarab, which is tragic considering Sarab's young age. It actually turns out, again, perhaps conveniently, that Sarai's connections in the United States with the United States Immigration and Naturalization Service, um, she harnessed the connection there and um, it paid off because inevitably they found a way that they could bring Sarai back to America. And that's exactly what happens, because the next scene is the three of them back in America. However, despite that safety and despite that kind of... Um, sense of resolution, Sarab is um, selective mute, suggesting a child who is very emotionally damaged by what's happened. Um, he states at one point, I only want my old life back. Uh, and of course, that can't happen. So it's a bittersweet ending to the novel. We don't get the happy moment of harmony that we perhaps want. We need about five extra chapters in this novel to get that, I think. Um, Amir states, Amir apologises, he says he's profoundly sorry for breaking the promise to Sarab about going back into an orphanage. And again, that shows progress in his part because he's a character that hasn't really ever apologised for anything before. Um, so he's had to prove his worthiness um, and um, he's making up for it. He never apologised to Hassan, for example. So that goes to show some development in his character. Once in America, um, Amir and Soraya become um, Sarab's adoptive parents. And after the meal with General Tahiri, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, the last image is of, of them kite flying in the US. And again, it's going back to that, that central motif of this novel, which is the kite. Um, it also obviously harks back to when Hassan and Amir flew kites together. This is a generation later. Um, and it goes to show the kite as almost a unifying symbol here. There is a sense that Saab will be OK. There's a sense that he will adjust to life in America with his new parents eventually. But like I said, in order to see that in this novel, we could do with an extra five chapters, perhaps, in order to see it um, fully. Before the end of the chapter, we get reference to the... Uh, meal that Amir, Sarah and Sarab have with General Tahiri and um, Jamila at the dining table. And General Tahiri questions and interrogates Amir as to why he's adopted and brought back to America a Hazara child. And this prompts um, Amir to imperatively say, you will never again refer to him as a Hazara boy in my presence. He has a name and it's Sarab. And that goes to show he's also developed the, the courage to defeat the antagonistic general 
um, in the small world of their family. Um, it also goes to show, of course, that he's taking issue now with people using the term Hazara. It's not good enough to use that term to describe somebody. They have a name, use their name rather than their ethnicity. We also contextually uh, have reference to the Twin Towers, so 9-11 and the atrocities of September the 11th, 2001. And of course, that meant the world changed on a numerous different levels, uh, one of which, of course, is a new era in Afghanistan's tumultuous past, which is the invasion of America and her allies in 2001. And what turned out to be a 20 year war from 2001 to 2021. And unfortunately, the unceremonious return of the Taliban relatively quickly after uh, forces left in the summer of 2021. And as I do this with you, as I record this video now, of course, in 2023, uh, the Taliban are now back in control. And goodness knows what's going on in Afghanistan because the media doesn't seem to want to report it very much. Um, but you can imagine what it's like. And the reason why this novel is so relevant, of course, is because it helps us understand that. It helps us understand our world because the, the Taliban between 96 and America's invasion is probably very similar to what it's like now. The last sentence of this novel is Iran, uh, suggesting that Amir has now taken on some of Hassan's redeeming qualities. For example, if you remember, Hassan was always the one that did the running. Uh, and now Amir is. And that was the end of the novel. Um, so it's slightly bittersweet. It's not a completely happy ending, perhaps, but at least they're all safe in America. Um, and the, 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 the um, implication is that they're going to be happy ever after, eventually, perhaps. So hopefully that was useful. Um, like I said, I will put all the links to the videos in the description box below. Um, thank you very much for watching and good luck with your studies. Thank you.